with the part in the agenda Recording where, progress. yeah, <laughs> where we're doing the flag for the Diane, do you want to? Dan. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so um, Superintendent Aldridge, do you want the report out of our I, I will. We had one item on closed session, and uh, the board voted. Um, uh, Jeannie motioned, and Alex seconded, and, and by a vote of four to zero with one absence, uh, to approve a leave of absence for a um, classified employee. Good, thank you. Now, at this time, we have discussed changing the order of the agenda to go ahead and do public comments now, as opposed to waiting for however long it takes for us to go through all our meetings and all our reports and all our everything else. And so a person, thank you, one wishing to be heard by the board shall first be recognized and then shall proceed to comment as briefly as the subject permits. In general, individual speakers will be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item, and the board will limit the total time for public input on each item to about 20 minutes. Now, if something happens and you need more than certainly, but that's that. The other issue is if two people have exactly the same thing to say and one goes first, the other is able to say, I agree with everything so-and-so said. And then if you had something extra to add, we give you three minutes to do that. Okay. okay, so we'll start with anyone wanting to make comments on things that are or are not on the agenda, which I trust is why we have come to. There's some printed out right there on the show on the counter. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Just sort of say who you are, please. Yeah, I'm James Ryder. Uh, I'm a son of the Brookside Kitchen and Garden. Um, I just wanted to clarify you had said that it doesn't have to be on the agenda to talk about it. It right. doesn't. Yeah, I mean, the reason I'm here is um, is really the mask, uh, the masking of our children. Um, so are you doing it on outdoor? No. Okay. I mean, I've, I've got I think talk about it, then I, I can't talk about it. Oh, no, you can. Go, you I, just I, add I might to it. Go first to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. You guys did? Can I come up and yeah. Thank you. Of course, you got your stuff together. Um, so, can I hand you guys some stuff before I start? Sure. My name is Shannon Folsom. For those of you who don't know me, um, first here, I, I've collected 600 and what does it say there? 600, 365 signatures from Mendocino County residents. You can direct them to the board members. I'm just the school department. Thank you. So here, I'll be going over all this. I have copies of everything, but I'm going to leave all this with you guys. Here's all the signatures. This is a petition that we have come together. And here's all of the um, documentation that I've collected over the last week and a half. And you guys can keep all of it. <laughs> okay, my name is Shannon Folsom. I've lived in Willis about 18 years. I worked at Willis Unified School District for about three and a half years. I have two students in Robert Lawson. Um, myself, we talk about our concerns about the outdoor masking requirements at our district. Um, I'll read the petition first um, to the World Team 5 Superintendent Joel Dridge and to the World Teachers Association. We, the undersigned parents of citizens in Mexico County, are opposed to the students, our students being forced to wear masks outdoors. We are officially requesting the outdoor requirement to be removed from the memorandum of understanding and the new school district. 
and Willis Teachers Association, and the Willis Genocide COVID Safety Center in regards to the Grand Outdoor Research. Um, as of August 31st, 2021, the MOU between Will Genify and the Teachers Association, number three states, face coverings are required to be worn properly at all times by all individuals on school campus, indoors and outdoors. As of August 23rd, 2021, the Unified, Will Genify School District Public Safety Plan has approved Section 2, number one states, face coverings are required for all persons, staff, students, parents, and community members. We're at the school site, indoors and outdoors, regardless of action status. <laughs> According to Mendocino County Public Health, health face covering order, which was updated October 4th, 2021, there is no mask mandate that requires anybody, anyone to wear a mask outside. Furthermore, July 9th, 2021, the CDC updated their guidance for the COVID-19 prevention in K through 12 schools to confirm that in general, people do not need to wear masks outside. We've contacted almost every school in the Ukiah district and none of these schools are requiring students to wear masks outdoors. Like in Sonoma County school districts, websites also do not require masks outdoors on their COVID safety plan. We're a smaller community with a smaller population. Why are our requirements so much more strict than our public health, Mendocino County Public Health, the CDC, California Department of Health? Um, where are these guidelines coming from? Can I ask you guys that? What guidelines are we following at this point if they're not recommending outdoor masks? Generally, during a thing like this, I mean, it's a perfectly good question, and um, you're welcome to ask them. It's just that as a general rule, it's not like a two-way conversation. Yeah. So not to be, things. Yeah. Okay. If, if you don't mind, just no, you sort of get to say everything okay. you like. <laughs> and that's what happens. Um, almost two years in this pandemic, there has been an abundance of research that finds long, long-term masking can even be detrimental to the health of our children. Not to mention the further risks that impose. On children participate and children participating in sports outdoors, outdoors and physically exerting themselves, our youth need a break from wearing masks. At the very least, they need to breathe fresh air, uncovered by during recess, sports, and other outdoor activities. Excuse me, the three minutes has hit. Do okay. you want someone to finish yes. reading that? Is theirs? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bye. sorry. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I can, I can get a time. Do you want me to finish reading that? Or? Yeah. I'll read it. 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 I'm um, James Greider. Thank you all for your time. I apologize for not having more speaking points and being more prepared because I just found out that this was even happening yesterday. So, um, I mean, my. Hold on, let me read. What about they, they basically, am I allowed to show them? Sure. <laughs> okay. sure. So, it's in front of you, you have, like, you have several documents. There's WHO, CDC, um, the cooking order. Um, California Department of Health, Cal OSHA, Mendocino County Public Health, and then all the different districts, their COVID safety plan. And it states in here that none of these organizations require okay. outdoor masking. So that's what I was Thank you. Thank you for that. So yeah, that's in your guys' papers. And then it just goes every single one and what uh, they require for you to do. So anyway, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, I just wanted to voice my concern about the masking because I'm not concerned about outside. I'm, I'm concerned about masks in general. It makes me sick to my stomach to see all these poor, my, my son's five, man, he's five. And he sits in the classroom, you know, Indian style looking at his teacher and he doesn't know 
you can't see her facial expressions. It, it, it's, it's just a huge thing for these kids. You can't see their kids' faces or their, their friends' faces. And that just really, really bothers me. And so I just, I really hope that you guys as a school board are doing something. I'm sure you are. I just don't know what it is. That's why I'm here to, to hear from you guys what your plan is for an end to this nonsense that just, that I personally don't see affecting our town. I, I always hear about these spikes and I never see it. None of my family members get sick. Nobody close in our circle ever gets sick. We never hear of anybody. And so I just, I just want to know what the plan is for bringing all this mask stuff to, to an end and, and our kids can just go to school like the normal. And uh, I just hope that it's something that means a lot to you guys and, and that we can, we can move past this mask stuff because I think that it's doing more hurt than good. And my children will not be attending uh, in class until we get this figured out. And I would really like my kids to go to school. I don't want to homeschool them, but I am now because the mask thing has just gotten out of control. And I think that we focus far too much on our kids wearing masks and it dipping below their nose. And then the teacher has to tell them that's all the time that she could be teaching them things about life. And, and she's sitting there telling them to bring their mask up. So those are my concerns. And uh, thank you guys for your time. Anyone else? Yes, I'd well, like to I say something. <laughs> No, um, actually, we're going to sort of do the audience first and then um, the virtual audience second. Okay. Uh, but you'll be called. All you have to do is just remember to say something when they are finished. Okay, please. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Cheryl McFadden, and I have five kids still in school, two in your school, and two at uh, Carter's and these last two years have been very challenging for you guys and as parents and for two years I have sat quiet I have sat quiet I have participated in the mask I have participated in testing I have done as a good parent citizen. Oh, 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 oh. okay I am seriously a person oh, I'm, I'm going outside it's in the other room let me just open that door Sorry, on occasion that happens. More at Brookside than everywhere else we thought. Oh, well. You know. Louis, can you please mute until it's your turn to speak? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Maybe we can restart your time on this. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I have done as I thought I was doing as good, as a good citizen, a parent. I have done and listened and, and, and been a good citizen. I caught COVID. I thought I caught COVID. Come to find out, I had, didn't catch COVID. It was a false positive. But my kids had COVID, false positive. I have sat back and today I've had enough. I have stood up. I, I fought for you guys recently as Angus Matheson threw you guys under the bus with his false thrown out there, you guys know what I'm talking about. But today I've had enough. I've had enough with COVID. I've had enough with our community fighting. I've had enough with it. Our kids have had enough, okay? These masks, these masks that our kids wear all day, my daughter's face is covered in acne. It's not just acne, it's staph infection. These things are filthy. Unless you're changing these throughout the day and not touching them, if not, I just touched them, I touched this. In Germany, they had these tested, 82 bacteria colony and four, four mole colonies. This was a simple Google search that I did just before I came here. And I've done a lot of research, a lot of research, because I wanted to know what this was. You know, I didn't look at this blindly, right? This has been two years of research. These masks give us a false sense of security. I see kids walking around with stuff down here, my son comes home with snot down his nose, okay? The teachers have no idea what's behind these masks, okay? 
I had his teacher tell him if he doesn't test, he's going to get COVID. I declined testing and they tested him anyways. That's not how it works, right? So we're asking you today, start fighting for our kids. Stand up for our kids, okay? We need, we trust you guys to take our kids. There's a lot of us that are going to pull our kids out. We're going to pull them out. Now, I'm not going to put them on homeschool within your district. I'm going to homeschool them about the district. Let them, we're not asking you to unmask them while they're in the classroom. We've compromised. We're saying when they're outside, you know, when you go to talk to somebody, we're going like this. What? You know, you can't understand the person next to you. So it gives a false sense of security. You're walking right next to them. You're getting closer. You know, I know it's a battle. So work with us. Let the kids have fresh air. Simple Google search. This is, and if you use DuckDuckGo, you won't be censored. Look at this. If you want to know what it is, I can share it with you. Thank you. Do you have any other? Yeah. Hi, my name is Kristen Emel. Um, I'm going to talk about what I was saying, you know, with that. I think we have enough with that. This thing didn't prove the health for nothing, you know, just making the people sick. I don't know if maybe some of you are familiar with the Busan, the gentle leader that they are using for the dogs for training them to work. When you are putting that Busan in the dogs, you know, for five minutes after they being been fighting, they are working with you. You know, they are obeying. I think with this thing, that is what they are trying, you know, to keep the people to obey. To work, well, we are in a lot of people, we know what is that situation with this. But uh, we don't need kids to obey because we don't need that. We need kids who think, who question, who find more uh, information, no follow what that shepherd said. We are not ashamed. We are not. We need kids who find something else to do. No follow a leader. No, we need kids to think by their own, by themselves. And with this thing, that's just what we are doing. Because this is not proving that is helping for nothing. Now the kids just see it at the street, in any place. Nobody is asking them to put double salt because I'm sorry for somebody to do salt. And it's very expensive for me. Nobody is asking them to put double salt. And they are money, they are putting double salt in the mouth. We don't need that. We need freedom. We need to be acting by ourselves, what we need, what we want, not what somebody wants. How I said, this is important that thing. I respect the people who already have lost, supposed to be after death, but I have my own experience. They just killed my father, Angela Guernagos, saying that I was COVID, and it wasn't. It was it's just about money. I want to respect, you know, the pain of everybody, you know, but I have been twice right here in the hospital, one right here in Wales and one in Ukiah. I have my husband and I and I see you, and they were saying, they were trying to put it in the, in the eye when it was a COVID, when it wasn't. My husband has cancer, and they were trying. They were trying. I saw, I'm a winner, that it wasn't true. They were lying. When I come from them, they were scared. They were scared. When I come from them, they say, are you trying to put him in the and any others that wish oh excuse me 
Uh, my name is Samantha Norton. I'm a short school parent, and um, I'm a little bit concerned about the heating situation outside for the Sherwood kids. Uh, we live less than two miles from the school, and we have a weather station, and it's been a pretty chilly, very wet fall so far, and now winter's coming, and in the mornings when I take my daughter to school, it's been in the high 20s, and the other day it didn't get above like 45 all day. So right now the short, <coughs> excuse me, the short students are eating outside with like just a carport covering with some picnic tables. And I was on campus for a Fossey meeting the week that we had like 16 inches of rain in four days. And the picnic tables were completely soaked, wet. There was, they had, there's a tarp up on one side, but it's really like not doing much to block the rain. And I understand that the kids are not allowed to eat in the classroom because then they would be unmasked and then they have to go back to the classroom and it causes problems with contamination, the COVID rules or whatever. But also my daughter personally has had three colds since she's been back at school this this winter or this fall, just and I think it's maybe contributed to sitting outside and being cold when she's outside eating. So I'm just asking if there could be some type of solution, like possibly an event tent, because sure it's a unique school that doesn't have a cafeteria. So if there could maybe be like an event tent that had sides and heaters, or I did speak with um, Mackenzie and she had said that she could maybe put um, <laughs> uh, on the on the actual metal sides that I had that was the thing that Doug, can you please mute yourself, Doug? Uh, that's really all I have to say, but I just am a little bit concerned. I don't even in first grade, and she, even if she's cold, she probably would not tell them. But I know that the kids are cold getting wet when they're outside. Thank you very much. She's my fiance. My name's Ray Elmore. I just want to elaborate a little bit because she she missed a couple of key points. I don't ask my daughter too many things about the guidelines because I'm not a big fan of masks. So I'm vaccinated. Uh, we follow guidelines, but I disagree with a lot of it. <clears throat> but I asked my daughter the other day, I said, what did you do for school, for lunch? I asked her every day, how was your lunch? And she said, it was good. I said, was your bench wet? And she said, yeah, I had to take off my raincoat to sit on my bench. So she was outside in 45 degree weather with her coat off sitting on the picnic bench, which is soaking wet. She's six years old. Last year, COVID again, the first day of school, didn't so. First day of school was 35 degrees. Okay, my daughter's first day of school, kindergarten, I put her in a burton snowsuit to go to school because they made her school outside, okay, west of her in a easy up tent, not a, an event, an easy up tent with three sides because they're worried about that with a pocket heater. Okay, she's five years old at the time in a snowsuit for top all day. Keep that stuff in mind, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I allowed to talk about another topic? Or just like this? Sort of at this minute, we're going to do COVID th mask things first, but then after that, yeah, you can talk again about it. Yeah. Okay, is it mask related kind of? Oh, well, in a few minutes, then yeah. <laughs> and anyone else that's here physically? Okay, then we sort of need to open it to the virtual types. So if if you're virtual and you'd like to speak on the issue of masking or not, then um, now is a good time to raise your hand. I would like to speak. Oh, okay, and you're Colby? Yeah, my name's Colby Friend. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I've had two daughters uh, go through the Willits uh, Unified School District from third grade. They graduated in 2016, um, top 10 in their class, both of them. They're doing great. I have three more 
Um, one's age 11, one's age 10, one's age eight, one in Blosser, one in Brookside, and one in Bechtel Grove. And so I'm very concerned about um, the, their schooling. Uh, I wanna say I agree with all these parents that are very concerned about this mask mandate and this over the top mask mandate um, from, from Willits Unified, which uh, not even Ukiah Unified is, is operating under in terms of uh, masking outdoors. I think that what's happening is it's discouraging kids from um, participating in extracurricular activities like sports and theater. Uh, my daughter says to me, she's at Bechtel, and she says, um, Dad, I wear this mask like seven and a half hours a day. I, I don't want to wear it for theater. She had a theater. She was offered a part uh, in, in theater. Um, and this is afterwards. You know, it's actually with the Wills Community Theater. But they, they wanted her to wear a mask inside. And she's like, you know, I just wear it too much during the day. I don't think this is healthy. Now my boys don't get to play basketball. They made the league all weird um, and they have to wear masks. Um, it's not healthy for kids not to do theater, not to do sports. Um, and the other thing is you're not allowing assistance in the classroom. And, and so these teachers, the ratio from teacher to parent to students is, is way off. Is is maybe one teacher for 24 kids rather than you have two adults in there for for 24 kids, which is one to 12. So is that healthier for the kids? It, it's not. Um, I just feel like, you know, we, we are not required to walk around with masks outside. Why are we requiring, requiring our kids to walk around with masks outside? And I just think it's unfair of you to be holding our kids' education hostage and saying they can't come to school, they can't get an education unless they follow these very nonsensical rules. And I really want to say that I have nothing against you people. I'm sure you're all lovely people, but th this, these rules, you have to look out for our kids. I mean, that's why you're there. That's why you're in the position that you're in. I think you're hearing it from a lot of parents and um, I, you know, I, I walked down today, I posted about this meeting because I wanted to encourage people that oppose this mask mandate to, 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 to speak up or come to the meeting, which by the way, I have to point out that your website only says that it's a Zoom meeting. So I didn't even know that you could come down there. And I think you should make that more clear. I don't know if you're trying to discourage people from coming to, to the actual meetings, but it, it did discourage me because I thought that it was only by Zoom and I would have I liked to have come down to the meeting. Um, but anyway, as I walked down the street uh, and was posting these, these posters on telephone poles and saying, hey, are you opposed to masks? We have a school board meeting tonight. You can voice yourself. Every car I passed was giving me thumbs up, smiles from all the parents. And, and everybody is on board with like setting our kids free from this nonsense. And I just want to say that, you know, I, I Again, I have nothing against you guys, but if you keep this up, I, I will get a team together myself to run against you all in the next school board elections and just say that, that we, are, we are not the people that, that instituted these mass mandates and that you are, and I guarantee we win in a landslide. And I don't want that. I think you're doing outside of this an okay job or a fine job, but you gotta stop holding our kids' education hostage. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Cole. Anyone else wish to speak from Zoom? Sorry. This is Billy Greider. I'd like to speak up. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, my son also in kindergarten at Brookside, um, and I echo all of the concerns that I've heard from the parents. Um, I believe that we have forgotten that the purpose for our children coming to that place, that establishment is for learning. It's their education. It's them learning how to socialize and live and, and, and be in this world. And when we go to school and when I pick up my son, it's frustrating that yes, when I ask him how his day is, most of what I hear about is the frustration and concern over his mask not fitting properly. And I, I just don't believe that the teachers and, and everyone in that building thinks that they are that in danger. I think we've just forgotten what we're doing. We go to school to learn. And I have picked up my child. Yes, the rash all over the bottom of his face. It's, it's disgusting. It's filthy. Um, and 
he's come home complaining of his teacher tied his mask too tight behind his ear because it kept slipping behind his nose. And when it does that, the teachers and the students yell nose check to whoever's mask has slipped down. If my child comes home and the only thing I hear about is how often he was told to fix his mask and that his ears are aching from the knots behind it and that his teacher tells him he can't pull his mask down to take a breath because he feels like he can't get enough air because they've tied his mask too tight, we have forgotten what we're in that building for. And we do need you as the board members to consider the systemic impact of all of these supposed uh, restrictions to protect our children. Are they really protecting our children? We need to look at the systemic impact and do something different because our children deserve to come to school and learn in a safe environment that is not causing more danger than it is good. That, that's all I have to say. Thank good you. job, Beth. Thank you. There's two more hands on Zoom. Oh, okay. So Morgan. you want to tell me their name? I'm from here. Morgan. Okay. She was saying Morgan Chuck is that? Oh, Morgan. Janine, Janine also had hers up first. Oh, okay. Hi, hi. So, uh, yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thank you all very much for being here. Um, so uh, I'm the special ed teacher at Brookside, and I'm really, really proud to be a teacher there and really happy for the team that we have and really want to make sure and express to everyone in person and listening that we are doing our absolute best for the kids. Um, we have a lot of restrictions under us or on top of us. And um, we could really, really use a lot of community help. And I'm really, really happy to see how engaged our community is because we need people to speak up and tell us what we need to change. And one thing that can really help these mask mandates is if we have more staff. We are so incredibly understaffed that we can't have enough aids to be with the kids outdoors. We might be able to, you know, cover, you know, the kids running around if we had some help. The cafeteria, we only have one custodian in the morning trying to help keep the surfaces clean and making sure it's properly ventilated and making sure that we are, you know, following the guidelines that are in place by the state. And we want we want the best for our kids. And all I really want to say is if the community is really getting fired up, come and be a part of the team and change it from the inside. We don't have to take it away. We have to fix it from within. So uh, thank you all very much. God bless. Thank you, Morgan. Renee, has her hand up? Okay, go ahead, please. What, are you, is it Janine's turn? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, hi, thank you for having this meeting. And um, my name is Janine Johnson. I am a mother of three and they go to Brookside, Blosser, and Bechtel, the B schools. And I want to definitely, um, you know, um, there's been a lot of really potent things that have been said today that I agree with. Uh, Jen, thank you for coming with all that information. And um, the teacher who just spoke, thank you for bringing that up. That's a major concern. And I know that as a parent who has been in classrooms and has volunteered in classrooms, I don't understand how the teachers are doing it right now. And it doesn't actually sound like they're doing it very well. Um, and from what my children say, it doesn't sound like it's happening very well. Teachers need assistance. They need parent assistance. Right now, when I go to drop my son off at Brookside, I'm not even allowed to cross the line to go onto the school property. Um, when I talk to the superintendent of Mendocino County, Michelle Hutchins, she was saying that <clears throat> Um, I could maybe sign up to be a, uh, um, a, a substitute teacher to be able to get into the classrooms. So we have to go to that extreme when we know that our teachers need help and these mandates are affecting our children in ways that 
are making it so that there is one teacher per a whole group of a whole group of students. And at the same time, I've heard of parents saying that there's a teacher that's using a whistle as if they were in a gymnasium to get control of their classroom because there's not parent help and assistance. The school needs our help. We are here to help, and these mandates are not helping in the way for what the institution is supposed to be there for, for, our edu for the education and learning of our kids. I also uh, want to reiterate that there is no policy across the board in any sort of fashion that says that masking outdoors is necessary. So that policy that has been put in place is not necessary for our children at all uh, and, and is an extremity that is definitely um, beyond what is needed as far as safety and concern. Um, I would also like to see that masks indoors would also be eliminated unless you have the personal choice that you would like to wear a mask. I am from uh, Northern California over in um, the Butte County, Glen County area. And that is what they're doing. They're a similar population. And if you would like to wear a mask, you have every right to wear a mask. But if you would like to not have to wear a mask, and then you don't have to wear them. Why are we institution, why are we putting these policies on these children that it does it's not necessary and it's definitely over the top and we're losing sight of what is the most important thing for this institution and that is the learning and education of our children again when i talked to michelle hutchins the the superintendent of the county when i asked her okay so what happens when someone gets pulled out of the classroom for a supposed uh, proximity to someone who reported that they had COVID. She said that there has been zero cases in all of Mendocino County of cross contamination from student to student as far as contempt for as far as COVID cases. Why are we taking the most strictest stance possible when we don't have any evidence that is proving that that's necessary? Really what I would love to say is thank you for holding this forum. And at this point, we are finishing a first trimester of school, of, of this, of this uh, being back in school. And let's reevaluate the policies that we've had in place. We've had plenty of time to, to look and to observe. We're, I'm talking to educators and logical, educated people here. Let's relook our we look at our policies and make some changes that will be the betterment for our children and All for right. their education in the long term. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Ms. Mansfield has his hand up. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Kenneth Mansfield. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Kenneth Mansfield. I'm a teacher at Willits High School, and I'm also the parent of a child at uh, Blosser Lane. And um, I've actually been, uh, both as a teacher and as a parent, very pleased that the school board has chosen to follow the science, to institute masking, to keep students safe, healthy, and in school. Uh, as a teacher, I've seen kids coming in and out, getting sick. I've had, um, multiple close contacts with my son. I have students who are immunocompromised and all of them need to have access to a safe education at school. And that includes safety from contracting coronavirus. And masking is the simplest and most effective way we can protect our students and our staff and allow everyone to stay in school, do their activities, there's just no alternative at this point to protecting everybody without masking, particularly indoors, um, but just in general, it needs to be continued until guidance comes down from medical experts, from the county health department, indicating that we are actually ready to remove masks. And until that time, we're endangering our students and the people who work at school. So I would encourage you to continue to follow the science and the recommendations and continue to mask our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
So is there another hand up? Those two of both oh. spoke. Oh, okay. Well, then we've pretty much used our 20 minutes. Um, I can't in my comments. That's usually the time. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, so then we we don't get to respond. Now, would you like to say whatever else it was that you had? Yes. To... Yes. This um, isn't masking. We're on no. a new public comment. Um, <laughs> okay. I, well, I get called to work every day at all the different schools. I work <laughs> at all the schools except San Diego. Um, I worked at Blaster today where my two children go. And um, there's when it's sunny, I'm not sure if the parents are aware of this, but they make the meat outside on the ground. When it's raining, they eat inside in a freezing cold cafeteria. Um, I, I, I actually witnessed today when I was leaving, right when you walk into Blosser, you go through the, the gate, and there's the corner where Miss Curry's room is. My daughter was sitting on a carpet, eating her lunch on the ground. And earlier on that day, I was making, I was laminating some stuff for the teacher I was working for. And I saw this cart, it was in my way actually, that's why. I thought of it and it was just stacked of carpets, these square carpets. <clears throat> and I was like, oh, okay. So then fast forward to lunchtime, I see all the kids sitting on these carpets outside on the ground. So we're we're really trying to, to keep things clean, right? But here you are passing out all these carpets that kids eat on every day that aren't clean and on the ground. My daughter's eating when people walk from the bathroom to the classroom and she's sitting on the ground eating her food. I just don't see how that's safe at all for our kids. So just wanted to put that out there so you guys weren't aware. My daughter eats outside every day. I know. Rain or shine. My kids no are what kind of I know. But they With no inside walls the forest. And no heat. And she's six years old. I know. It's but that's all I wanted to say. Thank, thank, you, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right. So now we are. Closing public comments, unless someone else has something else they feel like saying at this time. If anybody on here or here wants any of the information I provided, you can email me at Shannon Bolton at Is that science? Yes, everything, oh, I, everything I presented tonight, if anybody would like copies, email me at Shannon Bolton at Willow Unified. And I'll send it to you. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I did put my hand up. I'm so sorry. Uh, just about 30 seconds, some input, if I may. Go ahead. Mar I'm sorry. Okay. My name is Margo Singleton. I'm a teacher at Blosser Lane. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion, and obviously, people are deeply concerned and deeply worried. So I'm seeing, I'm hearing a few things. I, I do believe that the science follows that ventilation, obviously. And outdoors, this is the closest thing to ventilation, sorry for that little sarcasm, but obviously outdoors is working. Um, so we might be able to look at maybe managing some of that. Um, I know when I have my students run, I pace them, they count five before they go so that they can take their masks down and they can run without being close to another student. So things like that always help. But, but the bottom line is, it sounds like we can at least agree on maybe moving forward with some outdoor um, time with unmasking. Um, really quickly, the masking situation is only, for science, following the science, the masking situation is only really effective if you are using the masks correctly and if you're using the correct kind of mask. So again, we can look at what are we really doing and how can we improve what science we do know in ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we can move forward and I'm glad that everyone is so deeply concerned and so willing to work together. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Now, if there are any other- I, Oh, sorry, go ahead. I sorry. did wanna just say one last, one more thing. And if my I, one more thing is to say is that if we are so concerned about the health and well-being of our children, why is fruit roll-ups and candy and chocolate milk one of the major things that our children get every single day in the cafeteria? Health and wellness starts with nutrition. So if our school board is saying that we are so concerned about the health and wellness of our children, then let's look first at what is being served as food in the cafeteria. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now our public comments are closed.
No comments? Oh, that's cool. I have it. Okay, so now we're at the informational part. Please understand all of you are welcome to stay. Some of what you may hear real soon may be really helpful for you to know, but certainly you're not obliged, okay? All right, so CBEDS report. Okay, so uh, this is informational. Our enrollment is up by about eight students from um, the year previous um, with uh, at the, that same first Wednesday in October. Um, when that is measured. So um, we're, we're fairly stable with our enrollment uh, year over year. There's a little change when you look over each of the, the schools, some were up and some were down, but yeah. it's, it's averaged out to about eight students uh, throughout the whole district. Good. Um, B, educator effectiveness grant. So we have a grant program from the state. Um, we're required to, um, uh, put this out at a at a board meeting, um, and then come back around and adopt this at a, a uh, at the next board meeting. I was going to say it's too late in the day for big yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so at this point, uh, our educator effectiveness grant, uh, we are looking at using this to support uh, professional development uh, for our staff. Um, and the way we are planning to move forward with this is we have our teacher induction program, which is our new teachers have to complete within their first five years of having a credential uh, to be able to clear their credential and move forward. Um, so we're, we would like to use it to cover the costs associated with that. Um, this grant allows us to go through the 25-26 school year. Um, so that program runs about roughly $50,000 a year. Um, so we, we have uh, included that uh, portion of things. And then we are also including a portion of, a, um, of coaching uh, for our teachers um, that we have funded through our ESSER plans and some of the other plans that we've had coming through. Uh, we know that as we're, we're coming out of this, it's gonna be very important for our teachers to have that, that level of support um, and analyzing data and, and helping uh, students and just having somebody to bounce some ideas off of and, and being able to move forward. Um, and that pretty much uh, it, it takes up the entire encumbrance um, that, that we have there. It is, um, oh, I didn't print that one out. It's about $430,000, I believe. Oh, excuse me, 447. Um, and that those two items pretty much take care of, of uh, both of those. But again, it allows us to continue that. Um, the nice part with this is the, the money that we were spending, say, for the, the induction program was coming out of general fund. Now we have a grant to pay it. That allows us to have that open for uh, working with uh, additional staff or with salary increases or other things that we, we have some flexibility on. So this curriculum and instructional coach, that's already built, right? Uh, currently, yes, but we have a retiree in that role, so there's only so much they can work in the, the school year. So we're okay. going to start advertising to, to have a, a, um, that position. But we're currently using ESSER funds for paying for that position? Yeah, yes. ESSER will carry it for three years, and then this will pick it up for an additional two years. Thank you. Absolutely. And is this a fun, uh, grant that you applied for? Or is it one that just came our no, way? No, it's, it's just a block grant from the state. Okay. Yeah, it was a part of the, the funding that came through. Okay. Okay, so then we're on 8C and it's review and discussion of California School Employees Association initial proposal for contract negotiations with the district. The negotiations will cover the 2022 through 23 school year. Hmm. And I'm not sure if there's a CSEA rep who would like to speak to that, um, who's on the call. Yeah, I'm here, Joe. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, um, I don't have any questions. I'm just glad to be able to work with you and, and get this process going. Yeah, we're, we're waiting for your list in kind too. And so yes, we can start doing on that. Absolutely. That'll come next month. Um, as is pretty typical for us, and then we can uh, get some of those dates set. So you and I should probably uh, get together so that we can set those sooner rather than later. Okay, we can do that. Okay.
Then we're on WTA Pump. Brian? Yeah, I think I got chipped. <laughs> no. Wasn't <laughs> sure. No. Sure, you're even there, but Brian. Uh, my name is Brian Bowles, and I'm uh, stepping in for President Tessa Ford tonight. Uh, um, the first thing I want to say, most people have left already, but I hope we have an audience uh, online as well. I want to thank the community members and parents for their time and effort and courage to step outside the potential comfort zone to come here and speak to the board tonight. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on, but you act as role models for your students by standing up for your children and voicing your beliefs. And I further appreciate the role modeling of respect that occurs tonight. So as a teacher, as a coach, as a parent, uh, it's important to hear both sides. And there are more than two sides to the story, I'm sure. But I, I really want to take some time and, and respectfully appreciate the manner in which everybody accepts this. So, thank you. Uh, the, uh, along the same notes about the, the masking, I was in the hall the other day at the same time uh, our principal told it was there. And there's an advisor from Sonoma State that came through. And he's somebody that works with all of our different uh, groups throughout three counties, actually. Um, they were made nameless, but uh, he stopped both of us in the hall. I happen to have a shirt somewhere like I have one now that's separate than bullets. And uh, he said he, tra he traveled to all the high schools in all of the counties. He said that Willis High School is the safest school that he feels like because we were following the safety protocol. We asked him, you know, can you sign in, take the test, can you make sure that you're uh, appropriately uh, masked? And uh, we often test our test a lot of our people that come on campus with a Binax rapid test. So for him to make the extra effort to stop us in the hall, I felt was a good feeling. Um, we are, as teachers and as administrators, as maintenance staff, as custodians, doing the very best that we can and the circumstances that we have. And um, I just wanted to kind of run that point home that everybody is doing the best we can for education. I heard that in a lot of people who spoke already. Uh, I just want to restate that. Um, I wanted to put a different hat on for a little bit. Uh, I'm also the athletic director for World High School. Um, and I wanted to congratulate some of our student athletes who have made it through an entire season. Um, a couple bumps along the way with positive tests, but we were able to keep the programs running. I think because of the protocols that we have in place and the rapid response we've had from our, especially our secretaries at our high school site, who have done just an immeasurable amount of work keeping people safe and the administration at our site. And so, to push all the protocol aside, the big picture right now that I want to talk about is our volleyball team. For the first time in 10 years, they beat St. Lena in their own gym and in our gym, which is, a, I know, is a very big, uh, exciting day for their coaches, John and Nelson Jessup. We retire, or we retire, we graduate three seniors off that team. And they did so well in league that they were given a chance to be in the North Coast section playoffs. And so they get a North Coast section playoff ball, which uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jessup have been asking me about. We just picked it up yesterday. Uh, they'll sign it and they'll go in our trophy cakes for all, all eternity. But it's the first time, I think 2011 was the last time uh, Willis High School volleyball team competed in North Coast section playoffs. So congratulations to them. Uh, next on the list, we have another uh, playoff uh, berth, and that was with Girls Varsity Girls Soccer. They did the same thing. They worked uh, their butts off this year in the rain, the sleep, the snow, and the hail. Maybe not the snow and sleep, but they it was cold out there. And they uh, are coached by Jamie Wilkes and Sabrina Rodriguez. And they also made it to a playoff berth. Uh, they played against the league champion St. Lena in the first round and had a respectful 3-0 uh, loss against them, but played their hearts out. So I'm really proud of the girls' varsity soccer team. And then thirdly, um, we get to put some hardware up on the wall this year yet again for the second time in a row. Uh, with the asterisk of uh, no, no playing for the COVID last year. Uh, the JV football team has completed an undefeated season in league and brought home another trophy and tennis for us. So congratulations to the JV yeah. football team. 
They're coached by Matt Roddy and Matt Roundford. So congratulations to all those involved in that. Uh, thank God uh, on a whole different note, as far as our education and being able to survive on campus. I wanted to thank uh, specifically the maintenance department uh, and cash departments for their efforts in bringing many of our bathrooms uh, back online at the high school. And it was through their diligence and extra work ethic. Uh, because of that, I should say, we have working bathrooms at the end of all of our science and math halls in the history department and our English departments are all up and running. And it is drastically increased the amount of time away from class that our students have when they use the restroom. So we were talking, the difference is five minutes per bathroom break versus 15 to 20 and waiting in line. So it's drastically improved that part of our ability to educate our students. So thank you, Nathan, uh, for all your efforts there. Uh, on a, a little bit more realistic note, as far as uh, what we're going through, we're drastically understaffed. I would say it's all departments across the district, but specifically I'll speak about the teachers. Um, we're understaffed in a couple different ways, but mostly, well, not mostly, one way is that we don't have the substitute teachers, so we are sick. Um, the coverage is very tough to get. Um, had a couple times already this year where we have not had enough subs to cover the number of absences. And as this, you know, the flu season progresses, um, I don't see that improving. So it's, it's something that we're going to constantly be dealing with. And I, pre, I do appreciate uh, the administrators that have stepped in and done their role uh, as administrators in taking those classes uh, when they're not in the So uh, as, te as a teacher, I appreciate that greatly, uh, taking that on. Um, there's no subs for paras. There's no subs for buses. And all those things uh, affect the ability to get our, our kids up and running. Uh, so I know that we're all working diligently to improve that, but it's something that we don't want to forget. Um, one kind reminder, uh, I don't want to let it slip. Uh, this year was the first year in anyone's memory that students were required to attend school the day after Halloween. And I'm not saying that because I think we should make that a, a national holiday or anything, um, but common practice historically has been to have that day of the service day for teachers. Uh, I think it might be who the board and whoever else is involved in looking at our calendars for next year to make sure that we don't have some of the snafus that occurred this year. And it's, uh, I, I spoke with a few people and it looks like it has affected our ADA, our attendance. We're normally at this time at 95, we're currently at 90, or at least high school So, um, you know, and if, you know, if there's extra candy on those in-service days, the teacher would be happy to do that. But overall, I just wanted to I wanted to thank uh, everybody who's working in our district. This is absolutely a team effort, and it's a team effort with our administrators all the way down to the teachers and parents and janitors and everybody. Everybody has done more than their fair share of work to keep this ship afloat, and uh, and that's true for all the parents in the audience. Right? This is not an easy time for any of us. Uh, we're all going to continue to work diligently and hopefully. Uh, respectfully with each other to uh, get through this. And so uh, thank you for your time this evening and have a great uh, rest of your meeting. Thank you, Ron. Okay, CSEA, do you have comments? <coughs> good, after, good evening, everyone. It's, it's good to see the public show up and put some input in on some topics. It's always good to hear. Um, I'd like to thank all the classified staff for, for staying at the grindstone, keep working professionally, and helping everybody get through the current situations we're in. Um, we turned in our openers for contract negotiations, and we're looking forward to getting uh, the district's offers back and sitting down with Joe and get some dates going and start talking. Um, that's about it. Pretty short tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, board reports. Diane, do you want to give board reports? A hey, board report. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. On October 30th, Willis Teachers Association had a barbecue box left. And the 
invited all the um, employees for Willits Unified School District and school board. They brought their families. And it was nice to, we all mingled with um, the high school as well as the kindergarten teachers as well. And um, it was really nice. The food uh, was delicious with everybody. And um, yeah, we had uh, attended from uh, five different schools or five schools. So thank you for organizing this WCAA. The event um, was nice to see all our district um, family. It was really nice. Thank you, Jeannie. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say that I'm really appreciative uh, for the efforts the parents uh, took to attend to the meeting, either personally or on Zoom, and letting the school board know of their concerns. And uh, I uh, uh, have grandkids in the school, so I try to be aware of what's going on. Um, um, with kids as far as my grandkids go, but it was really nice to hear from Karen. And uh, I uh, I personally am not into mandates. I, I have problems with mandates uh, because I think they've been politicized. And, uh, and I'm not saying it's politicized on one side and not the other. It's politicized on both sides. And um, there's no... Um, Clear. I know I was just meeting before I came that there's a current article by uh, Mendo Fever, who's um, actually a teacher in Ukiah, but he talks about the dissension among the ranks. Each Emerald County goes its own way regarding indoor masking mandates. And he talks about Trinity County, Humboldt County, and Mendocino County have all gone, their um, public health officers have all gone in different directions as far as indoor masking goes. And so it's not something that's cut and dry. And uh, it's not something that, um, that everybody sees in the same light. So uh, I think it's something that uh, the board really needs to discuss and, um, and uh, talk about. So uh, I appreciate the parents bringing it up. Um, I also attended the wonderful events that WTA put on in which they invited everybody, all the employees from the school district to attend. That was an outdoor barbecue. It was, if it had been held a week early, it would have been raining, but it turned out to be a very nice day. So, um, so it was very enjoyable. And I also came and attended the, um, the Day of the Dead celebration at the high school, which was a cultural um, celebration and uh, the artwork was just absolutely amazing. There was um, food and music and pinatas and it was really a, a lovely event. And uh, everybody seemed really happy to be, um, all the kids seemed to be happy as well as the adults, the teachers. And it was a very nice event. I'm glad I came. And uh, you may think I'm silly, but this, I started to see a pattern and things that were popping up in my awareness. Uh, one through an interview on, on a radio of an author and another one uh, on a, um, a book review I saw twice in two different uh, media sources. And then another one in regards to, um, to a, uh, to an email that I get from this one um, person. Anyway, it, it, they all had to do with how teachers impacted people's lives. And um, so the first one is about Albert Camus. When Albert Camus was less than a year old, his father was killed on the battlefield of World War I. He and his older brother were raised by their illiterate, nearly deaf mother and a despotic grandmother with hardly any prospects for a bright future. In a testament to what happens when education lives up to its highest potential to ennoble the human spirit, a teacher named uh, Louis Germain, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, it's French, saw in young Albert something special and undertook the task of conjuring cohesion and purpose out of the boy, the task of any great mentor. 
Under his teacher's wing, Camus came to transcend the dismal cards he had been dealt and began blossoming into his future genius. Three decades later, Camus became the second youngest person to receive the Nobel Prize, awarded to him for a clear-sighted earnestness of his work, which illuminates the problems of the human conscience. The first thing he published after he received the Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize was a letter to his teacher which I won't bother reading, but you can find it online. And the second one, uh, this was, um, I saw two interviews, uh, two um, reviews of this book. In his new memoir, Rescuing Socrates, How the Great Book Changed My Life and Why They Matter for a Whole New Generation, Roosevelt Montes, who was a senior lecturer at um, Columbia University, and I believe he's in charge of their core curriculum, their great books curriculum tells about being a newly arrived 11 year old Dominican, and these are his words, with a head full of lice and a belly full of tropical parasites, and that he seemed an unlikely candidate for the Ivy League. As a teenage boy on a busy street in Queens, New York, he found a volume of Plato and a stack of books thrown in the trash. Sometime after finding the volume, Mr. Montes was leafing through it in the hallway of his high school when he was spotted by a teacher named John, uh, Philippides, I'm probably not pronouncing that right. As, Do as Mr. Montes recalls, the teacher fire in Philippides' eyes lit up, and before long, Mr. Montes had a mentor who would encourage him to apply to Columbia University. He was admitted to Columbia to a state program for students with financial need and academic underpreparedness. And the last one was an interview I heard on the radio. Um, it was a KCYX um, fresh air interview. Uh, Richard Antoine White. He just published his memoir, I'm Possible, a story of survival, a tuba, and a big dream. The author, who was Black, started his life living homeless with his alcoholic mother on the streets of Baltimore. His father was incarcerate, uh, incarcerated. At about age four, Richard was taken in by a family and starts going to school but having difficulties adjusting to life for the family and the expectations of school. In the fourth grade, a music educator came to his class and displayed all the instruments, woodwind, brass, everything. He started playing the trumpet. Music was the first time he felt a sense of belonging. He said, when you play in a band or you play in an orchestra, regardless of your ethnicity or your underrepresentation, we all get to choose from the same notes and we all have this common goal. So I felt a sense of belonging. Richard tells the story of one of his middle school teachers, Ed Goldstein, who was an instructor at an extracurricular program. Mr. White tells how he wasn't practicing enough and wouldn't follow through on his homework assignments. And Ed just came in one day, you know, eyes red, almost watery. He, you know how much I'm, he said, you know how much I make doing this? You know, I don't have to do this. You know, I do this because I want to give back and make a difference. You know, I pay this in parking, I pay this in gas. You know, I may turn down this gig here and there, so I'm not making money on this. And yet you refuse to practice and you come in here and waste my time. I felt like I had disappointed him so bad. I saw something in his eyes that I wanted to make sure that I would never let him down again. So that changed my whole attitude. Richard Anton White graduated from the Baltimore School for the Arts, went on to the Peabody Conservatory and so on. He now has a doctorate in tuba, is a professor of tuba at the University of New Mexico and is the principal tubist for the New Mexico Philharmonic and Santa Fe Sympathy Symphony. So anyway, I just wanted to speak about all that teachers do, all that schools do, all that people that work at schools, every one of us mentors kids, and that uh, what a tremendous difference it can make in people's lives. And uh, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's no Alex is here. Oh, yes. Yeah. Does he want to make a report? I don't know. Oh, oh well, one more thing oh. I want to say is that one of our um, board members is on via Zoom because he's not well and um, absent because of a family illness. So um, that's why there's only three of us here.
And Alex, do you wish to make a report? Yeah, real briefly, Paula. Um, Please. I apologize, I'm not able to be there. I am under quarantine, thanks to the lovely COVID virus. Um, those of you that know me know that I don't typically complain too much about these sorts of things. Um, and uh, I have to admit that uh, I wouldn't wish this on my dog or your dog or anybody else's dog. Um, it's not a pleasant experience. Um, that said, um, I can certainly appreciate um, making every reasonable effort to follow the science, to keep both um, our children and our staff uh, safe as we, we reasonably can um, and our schools, and by extension, keeping our community safe. Now, all that said, after listening to the uh, public comments today, I believe that there is room for compromise with respect to uh, outdoor masking. Um, we still need to be diligent about making sure that we follow the science and utilize that to the best of our abilities to keep more than anybody else, your children safe. So, um, but by that same token, we cannot, you know, we are, we are obligated by law to provide a safe work, working environment for all of the employees of the Willis Unified School District. Um, right now, the indoor mask, mask mandate happens to be a mandate set down by the state. Um, and we're so, certainly not going to be able to, uh, um, you know, to avoid that until the, the health department, the state health department um, comes up with a better idea. I still think that the best, the best um, opportunity to get past this pandemic is vaccinations. And wherever possible, please encourage anybody that you know that has not been vaccinated to please get vaccinated. Um, and, uh, and hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, we'll be able to put all of this behind us. In the meantime, um, Mr. Bowles was absolutely correct. The district is short staffed in so many areas and much of it, it relates right back to um, COVID and uh, the, uh, uh, the trickle down effect, if you will, from many aspects of how COVID is perceived both politically and not in, in our community. Um, if you have an interest in volunteering or becoming an employee of the district in so many ways, please you know, contact Trina at our district office and look into what you might be able to help to provide the district. Um, I know that we are desperately short of bus drivers, for example. Um, it doesn't pay a lot, but it does have the benefit of putting you in a place where you're helping your community, you're helping the school district, and indeed, in no small way, you'd be helping our, helping our schools. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, and there are many other places in our district that you can help as well. There are restrictions involved. I'm sorry to hear that, you know to to point that out that those restrictions are unfortunately COVID based. But until this this pandemic is behind us, we're going to be dealing with those things, and we're all going to have to try and be flexible. But if you think that you might be able to help the district in some way, uh, please contact Trina. We'd be We'd be very much interested in entertaining whatever help you can provide. Thank, thank you, Paula. Thank you. Okay, and for me, a few things to say. I, I also was lucky enough to get to go to the picnic that WTA put on. Um, Brandon and Brian did an outstanding job. And I really also felt that it went really smoothly. Um, I, for the past, couple of weeks have been spending an awful lot of time at Glosser Lane. Um, and I wanted to especially, especially thank Kelly, who was here, or oh, he's still here, good girl. <laughs> anyway, I, I really appreciated all that you were able to do for me. And I hope I don't need your help again, but nonetheless, thank you. It was very involving and it was really good to know that our district does have all of the personnel it has doing as very well as they can. It is real true by everyone's account that the district is shy at least one person in just about every single department of the school district. I think there are two departments truthfully out of everything that isn't lacking at least a part-time spot. Um, I, I was pleased to see so many people here I must say, however, that I 
100% agree with Alex about vaccinations being the very best way to fight an illness. Sadly, I am old enough that um, I know about polio and things like that and how important those vaccinations were. And the other list of little vaccinations all our students are expected to take before they come to school. And my personal view is that I'd like to see a couple more added to that list. I, however, am mostly interested in people coming to see for themselves exactly what goes on. However, there is a current restriction about going into school. And um, the very best you can do for a short amount of time according to the health department speaking to me, was observe what happens, maintain a distance, and disturb no one. And that's a real difficult thing to do when you hit a school ground and you know there are all those children there. Um, one thing I'm not sure all of us understand is that the basketball team did just start its tryouts. And because there was a, a case of COVID or an exposure to COVID, that came out in a, a test, they have to sit down for two weeks and quarantine themselves, sort of. Not really, they don't have to, they're not missing school that I know of. Actually, I only have part of the information, so I guess it's silly to say, but I know that for two weeks, there won't be any basketball practice because of a COVID issue. I also know that the last three football games at the high school were not played because of COVID amongst its players. So my biggest deal with that is that even though those kids didn't wear the football players outside, certainly they had a lot more close contact than we hope for our children. But at the same time, it just sort of opens the floodgates to the possibility of our students, our children not being 100% safe with at least a little bit of protection. As far as AIDS, they do want to work in classrooms. Sadly, they are outside monitoring and taking care of the children during recesses, breaks, lunches, et cetera. And there aren't enough of them at this point since some of them have been out ill to cover classes as well. So some of the information some people in our community are noticing is information that looks one way given your frame of reference, but in reality is another way. And that's why I really do think that it would be best if people just had a little more time and opportunity to come in and, and ask directly before they upset themselves. As far as upsetting us, I truly believe we're not upset and that every member of the community has a right to come in, voice their opinions, and truthfully stand up for what they believe is in the best interest of themselves and their families. Those of you who know me know that I've done that for years. It's a good thing to do, whether we do or don't agree. And that's all I have to say. So, Mr. Superintendent, do you want to make comments? Uh, certainly, I have a few things. Um, first off, uh, with, uh, uh, WTA to end masking outside on February 1st. Um, the, the thought process behind that was that it gets us through the holiday season um, and through any incubation periods around that. If uh, we, we have any other indications that, that give us uh, reason to change that, we will certainly revisit that um, again. Uh, we have started our negotiations with WTA and are looking forward to starting with uh, CSEA as we, uh, once we have the opportunity to sunshine next month. Uh, for our construction, we are working on an alternative plan for Brookside West Wing that will allow for a smoother transition as money becomes available. Um, we're looking at adding two classrooms, but putting them in a different position so that we don't have to tear down the West Wing just yet, that we can kind of concurrently use those until we can get enough space built to, um, uh, to actually tear that down and, and engineer what we want to do with that space as well. Um, our Windows project has been uh, sent to DSA, DSA. They have responded, and we have sent the, their the answers to their questions back. And so we're waiting for their next round of questions or their approval. Um, uh, I too wanna to thank WTA for the barbecue. It's very good, it's a very fun uh, opportunity there. Um, we do, uh, I will be bringing forward to you next month. Uh, we were talking about this just uh, before the meeting today uh, that we would like to look at a, a pay rate increase for our substitute teachers 
um, just because as we've done a countywide comparison, we're kind of falling behind in that. So we want to bring that forward and, and share that with you hopefully next month. Um, we, uh, just to clarify to anybody out there on Zoom, we are having public meetings when we have this. So we would encourage you second Wednesday of every month. Uh, we're here at five o'clock. So we would, you know, we would love to have you here. Um, Um, we will have uh, MCOE will be up working with our admins next week on Thursday to plan EL supports and professional development around our English learners uh, for the rest of the year um, and, and start setting out some really solid plans around that. Um, we have uh, made a contract with Better Lesson and this group uh, provides virtual coaching for teachers. And we still have about eight slots available. So if there are any teachers out there listening who would like to participate, um, it's uh, the time commitment on that is about half an hour to 45 minutes every other week or as often as you wanna reach out and, and, and contact this person. Um, and finally, I had the opportunity to attend the leadership summit put on by the Association of California School Administrators last week. There were many good sessions, uh, had a nice one um, that was sitting with some lawyers on some legal responses um, to just some of the issues going on in schools right now. Uh, some employee relations, uh, co-teaching, um, and uh, making academic progress. Uh, the, the nice part is it was an affirmation of some of the efforts that we have in place and was also some good ideas for, for things um, that we, we should be addressing in the future. So thank you very much for the opportunity for that. And uh, hopefully um, we can continue to do some learning events like that. Is the MCOE um, thing through Zoom or whatever, or is it in person? No, they're gonna come to our admin meeting. Um, oh. So it's, it's okay. that's where we're starting and then we'll roll that out from there. So. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. I'll love however much you can share. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll share details thank afterwards, you. so. Um, before we go on, did you have a comment you needed to make? Um, sure. I, do. I just want to. I just want to hear everything that you guys had to say. Oh, well, we're not still. finished, and you're welcome to stay. Oh, I just thought you. Uh, oh well, I did raise my hand to one thing you said. But oh what? I guess I I forgot what that was specifically. Oh, I just. Sorry. I just it's driving me crazy. Everybody keeps getting on here talking about masks like we're doing the protocol and everything's going good. And that's not how it is, man. There are people going to massive sporting events, getting drunk and spitting all over each other. And, and that's totally okay. That's totally okay for the state of California for you to do that. But but our kids have to wear masks. I don't get it. They have to have a mask to be taught stuff, but people don't have to have a mask to get drunk and party. I'll never understand it. And I just, you say that there's nothing you can do. It's given to us by the state. There's nothing we can do. I would love to see us try. Can we please try to do something and tell the community what we can do to help you guys? We would like to be on the same team. And if we need to go to battle for you guys, we're ready to go to battle. And, and we don't want to just hear that, oh, it's just what the state's doing. That's, we're Willis, we're not the state. And, and I hope that you guys would not just follow what the state says and, and, and see how it's affecting our community. And then we just treat our community how they should be treated. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and Paul, I'm okay, sorry, uh, one ahead. thing I did forget to address was just from the comments tonight about the structures at Sherwood. So on Friday, we do have an additional structure going up there and we have ordered and we're just waiting for the, the some quality metal siding to come in so that we can put up something permanent around that that uh, does close that structure in and, and keep it a a safer place because there is there isn't a cafeteria there so and there's but then never has but then what's the point of being outside if you close the whole thing in like it's a building then let's be in there where the heater is that's I, not fixing anything putting walls on it. I, I understand, but at Sherwood, you have to understand they've always eaten outside. Like, like it's always been a practice that they've had okay. at that school. So it's a little different at Sherwood versus okay. some of our other Thank schools. You Certainly, yes. Um, so, so we are working on that. And thanks to Mr. Bowles and his, um, uh, his class is actually going to go up and assemble the structure uh, as a part of the construction class. So um good. that's and really good. yeah it's uh involving some of our kiddos too so that's that's really good sorry that's all i have good no that's really good 
Okay. And I hope that you understand there is already work going on between MOUs and the associations to do the best the district can in covering everyone's concerns. Because certainly we heard a lot of concerns about the no masks. Mm -hmm. We only heard two about masking. And yet if you wander through the campuses, there's an awful lot of concern about masking. Of course. And, and, and how and they we're feel. all concerned too. And, well, and I, I wish think. that those people would use their freedom to wear a mask. And I don't think that they should be bullied or in any kind of way for wearing a mask. Just don't make other people. And that's where it is for us is the forcing. That's where we have a problem, where it's forced on us. Yeah. And, and, and naturally that can kind of be debated for a while, but I appreciate Thanks. your attention today. And I'll go back to following directions. All right. We are, we've already done the consent stuff. So how about consent agenda? We put, did anyone want that? Do you have anything on there, ladies, that you'd like pulled off or discussed before we pull it off? Like, did you see the board meeting calendar and stuff like that? And the MOU with CSEA for the van driver position. Are we all okay with all of that? Okay, then I just put those together, right? <laughs> okay, so the we need an uh, a move and a second for the consent agenda. I move that we um, um, uh, accept the consent agenda as listed on the agenda. I'll make the second. Thank you, Alex. Okay, so it's moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, so all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so it passed. Now the curriculum discussion. Okay. So I provided you because I knew we wouldn't have enough time to really go as deep as a, a nice report. So uh, as a part of this, there, there is the 20 page curriculum report that has information that our, our principals have done an excellent job of putting together that really outlines how they're using each of those programs at the schools. Um, in conversation with them, they, they really had encouraged um, you as board members to please reach out to them so that they can sit down with you and, and walk you through it. They thought that would probably be the most effective way. They're willing to take some time to sit down with you and pull out the textbook, let's take a copy home, that kind of thing. Um, take a look through it, that, that sort of thing, if you have those kind of questions. Um, at, because as we brainstormed, it was just too hard to try to get into a report format, anything more than just kind of this cursory information. Um, we're also working to make sure that you can get some access to uh, our online. I know that you've gotten access to some of them. Others are just more particular and it's, uh, the, the problem isn't necessarily getting you a login. It's getting you a login that shows you something without a class being present. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of where we've been. We've had some, some difficulties there. Um, but otherwise I would open it up to any questions that we had about our curriculum. I I, uh, I was sort of, um, I had sort of this aha moment when I went to an in-service at the beginning of the school year um, uh, when the um, Brookside and the Blosser Lane staffs were getting um, um, in-service and using benchmark. And I retired in 2005. And anyway, and I'm, com I'm computer literate, but it amazed me that nobody got out a book. Everybody got out their laptop and looked on a, at information on the laptop. And I realized that education had changed and the way children were being, the way teachers were, the materials that teachers were using and how they were getting their information and how the information was being passed on to children had changed. And I began to question when it said textbook and when we, adopt a textbook, were, were we really adopting a book or were we adopting a, a digital curriculum? And I became really curious as to how schools were different from when I was teaching. And uh, I really became, and I became aware that, um, that we still adopt textbooks, the board does, but we don't, aren't necessarily adopting digital curriculum. 
and the digital curriculum sort of gets bought and put into place, but not really adopted by the board. And that the board doesn't really have a chance to see the digital curriculum before it's purchased. And so I sort of became really interested in what we're doing from site to site to site in the school district, what materials we're using and which are digital and which are hard copy. And I really appreciate the efforts that the administration at each site has gone to and Mr. Aldridge uh, and also the staff in providing the information to the board because looking at the document on, um, on the district-wide curriculum, I have a much better understanding as to what is, um, what is being utilized and what format it's being utilized. And um, so anyway, I really appreciate it. I hope that the, that the administrators and the staff members have gotten something in and also Mr. Aldridge have gotten something out of this whole exercise of looking at the curriculum um, uh, from elementary school to the high school. And um, it's really helped me a lot. I'd still like to um, to get it, uh, to be able to look inside Second Step because uh, SEL curriculum is very controversial. And uh, if I have a parent that asks me about it, I'm going to say, I don't know, I've never seen it. <laughs> you know? We'll, we'll so, make arrangements. Uh, I can look at their examples online, but that doesn't really tell me what's in the curriculum. So I'd still like to be able to see inside some of these digital curriculums so I know what's being taught. So I come from an informed place when I interact with um, with the public. So anyway, I really appreciate everybody's efforts on putting this together. OK. Then um, we're on item D, approval of AB361 determination 30-day review. OK, so this, uh, if you'll remember, last month you approved a resolution um, and uh, that allows us to continue to have uh, virtual meetings if we have, say, a surge in cases that allows us for us to have, as we did tonight, some input from Zoom. Brown Act is kind of quiet on this because it wasn't really a technology that was very prominent whenever it, it came through. So this clarifies and by approving this, we can continue to make sure that we can have folks providing public comment um, via Zoom as well. Okay. Are we gonna go through the whole voting for it again? And it doesn't have to, do it, we just have to approve it by a general vote now that the resolution is in place. Oh, so. okay. So then is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So yes. you, is someone here to move um, to uh, to move? Well, I'll make the motion to approve. Thank you, Alex. I second it. Oh, good. Okay, it's moved and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Good. aye. Okay. And then um, it's carried. So it continues aye. for another month. I have a copy if you want to read it over. Oh. And if you don't, you don't have to. Anyway, so now E, approved, approval of salary schedule, elementary therapist. Thank you. Um, unrepresented classified. And so um, I, I should have listened to Trina better whenever we were doing this, that um, the, the initial schedule that I came in on was actually uh, low for what we, we did. So what we had done is um, actually increase the dates or the amount of days of service. And so it, it is roughly um, similar to our current MFT. So we just are, are going to combine those two into the same salary schedule. The MFT only serves 100 days. And for the difference in um, service, the, the uh, elementary therapist will serve 195. Um, and so that makes up the difference for qualifications differences, in my opinion. So. OK. So then um, we need a motion to approve that. So I move that we approve uh, item E on the agenda, the um, elementary therapist um, represented capacity. Oh, okay. I'll second that. And a second, do we have? Thank I'll you. second it. So we've moved in second. Good, thank you. And um, we'll take a vote. All in favor? 
Aye. Uh, okay, good. And that's passed. <laughs> so now the we have the first read that um, are now up. And <laughs> I agree with what Alex used to always say. You have a good time reading them. <laughs> and any questions, call the DM. <laughs> it's okay. Now, does anyone have any items in particular they'd like on the next board agenda? Mm -hmm. We have to vote on the first reads or? No, they're just first reads. No, so there's no, no action required. I do want to say, uh, I'm still struggling with doing this online on, on a digital, uh, is that I interact with the whole board packet uh, and I internalize it and I understand it a lot better because I write on it, I circle things, I underline things, I scribble notes. And even though this online gamut thing has a place where you can look, scribble a sticky note, uh, it's not the same as circling things, underlining things, scribbling on them. Um, it's not the same. So, um, but I'm working on it. And uh, uh, one thing I noticed, and I pointed this out to uh, Superintendent Aldridge, is that um, there's something about CSBA's um, way of putting these documents together for Gamut, where it's um, causing problems with, uh, I don't know if they're using AI, artificial intelligence, to, to uh, transition these documents into Gamut, but there's typos and typos and typos and typos, and um, uh, some are misspelling some things it goes along and suddenly it just drops off. And uh, so I did my best. I went through and highlighted some of the things so Joe could see what I was talking about. But I'm hoping that uh, CSBA has a better way of doing this because it, um, I certainly don't want these documents to end up in our policy full type of thing. Do they suddenly end like that on the policy on the website as well? Yes. Well, I don't know. I looked at it in print and I looked at it on here, and they're the same. So uh, there's some where it's a formatting problem where the words just sort of run into each other. There's some where, like, the word two is written, the O is missing, or the word B, the E is there, but not the B. Uh, there's um, words misspelled. It's um, sort of a mess. I'm I too have found that the new format is a little. Yeah. Right, and I'm not. I'm just saying that it's probably a problem with the new format, and once they get the new. Yes, and it won't. It doesn't like you to copy and paste, like because I do a lot of mine in Word, and then want to copy it in there. But they really make it very difficult, and they want you to do the track changes right. in their format, and it's very odd. Yeah, but anyway, I'm not complaining. Adjusting. I'm just pointing it no, out. Yes. And saying that something that maybe we need to be aware of. So a couple of comments. Yes, please. Um, clearly, this is one of an, of several products out there that are allowing us to uh, use the digital media for um, for dealing with board documents. Um, if if Gamut Online proves to not be satisfactory to us, um, I'm I guess what I should say is, in, in my opinion, we should consider utilizing this format, this tool for a given period of time, three months, six months, maybe a year. Uh, and if we don't find that it is satisfactory, then we can uh, we can start looking for another option is really the, probably the best way to put it, whether it's going back to the old paper model that we've had in the past, which I know Jeannie would prefer, um, or we can utilize this. Now, obviously, in my opinion, this is a, a, an improvement over what we have had, um, however, if it's going to be problematic because of um, formatting and uh, typo errors and so forth, then we would want to take a look at something else. If those errors are being generated on our side, then it's kind of hard to throw stones at, at CSBA and their product here. On the other hand, if they're being generated by, uh, by this product, then I would argue that CSBA needs, CSBA needs to clean up their act. I do not know what we're paying for this. I'm sure that uh, 
uh, Joe and Rochelle can probably let us know about that. I don't know that it's a, if it's expensive or not. I'd be interested to know roughly what we are paying for this. I can, we can check the invoices. Yeah, I, I believe it was around $3,000 for a year, but I'm not sure. Um, we which can check is and see. just adding the online capability. Yeah, which is we just the- We pay a subscription for the policy manual services correct. already. Yeah, so we have a policy service um, through them, uh, through Gamut, but just for this, this additional piece is about three thousand dollars a year, I believe. Yeah, I was going to say I think it's an annual subscription, so it seems reasonable to me that we would take that you know year period of time to right. see if it works for us, unless something really out of control is happening. And, we need to and that that's, that that sounds fine to me. It's clear to me a, a, a subscription cost of three thousand dollars. You know, on the surface, it seems might might be a little bit expensive, but I have little doubt that um, from the time savings aspect and the ability for multiple people to be able to submit their documents and attach them to the various elements in the, in the agenda um, without having to go through multiple steps like we've had in the past. I'm sure that that $3,000 is money well spent in terms of the time savings on the part of staff. So I don't have a problem with the $3,000. Uh, but again, if, if, the, if the problems, if the accuracy problems develop into something we can't deal with, then we need to look at a different product. So. I'll shut up right there. Okay, did you have anything? So is that what you want added that we discussed, Gamut? Or these are not for the next agenda? Are we just talking? We, we can have a check-in on Gamut the next time around because this is really the first um, month that, we've, we're trying. that we're trying. So we'll, we'll keep checking in with you and we'll see if there's anything. We'll, we'll try to address some of the issues that you brought up this evening as well. So thank you for the feedback on that. And I, I just want to say I know it's not all about me, so I, you know, I can adjust. But um, well, I like it in Yeah, I, I like getting paid. <laughs> I'm truly challenged here, right. and so I, I like that. Anyway, thank you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, we're challenged. Yeah. No, no, thank you for the feedback around <laughs> oh, okay. around the product. We can't get better with it if, if we don't know what the issues are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, so at, then, at huh. the risk at the risk of um, of bullying anybody towards the end of the meeting, I'll make a motion oh, to adjourn. Are you making a motion to adjourn? <laughs> oh, well, um, before we adjourn real quick, as I, this is my first, um, I don't know how the, how this all works, um, but I guess I was just wondering, there was a lot of voices that came and presented the most uh, as far as unmasking and um, not having, um, how does that, how does that, what is the next step? What happens now? Is there a vote? Do we, is there a discussion? Does that go on to the next board meeting? Like how, how, what do we see action? Do I need to, do I, do I need to propose this be something that's on the next board meeting? Like, how does this work? Superintendent Aldrich already said that We've reached a agreement with the teachers union regarding unmasking outdoors February 1st. So it sounds like something that's already in process. Well, I, the, how is that any time a timely manner to make a decision? I mean, it was made the decision to decide to mask the kids outdoors was made within a week. We first we were going to school with unmasked outdoors and then within a week that changed. So why is it going to take four months before we can decide to not have mass outdoors again? It's my understanding that because it was in the teacher's contract that that had to be worked out and that, uh, that we were trying to get through the holiday season since families travel during that time and gather together and it would give the school district some time after and families after the holiday season to um, to work out any um, exposure to COVID that they've had. But explain why that time is needed where there is no policy anywhere in the country that says masking outdoors is necessary. Why do we need that amount of time 
when that's not a policy that anyone is pushing and we were able to change it within a week, why can we not change it tonight? The initial change from not needing a mask to needing a mask came from a state mandate. That doesn't take any votes, any agreements, any negotiations, it takes absolutely nothing but a mandate from the governor, which we got. There is no, there is no current mandate that requires masking outdoors, anywhere. There is. There, our contract for our employees, the Teachers Association, has that. We don't call it a policy. We call it a part of their working conditions. It is a contracted issue. Now, so Willis Unified is the only district that has that because Ukiah does not observe that. There's no other districts that are observing that. And I'm talking if the if the teachers would like to wear masks, that's fine. But for the children, there's no mandate that says children have to wear masks outdoors. There are mandates in other districts. You can go up to Potter Valley and they have that mandate. You can go into Covalo, they have that mandate. And these are districts that are smaller than ours. I mean, somebody commented that, gosh, we're so small. Why would we have to do it when the bigger districts don't? <clears throat> Each district negotiates with its teachers. And even though I, I certainly am out of line arguing with you, I don't mean to do that. I just need you to understand that some of your information hasn't been as straight with you or some of your informers of information have not I quite find my... I'm going on the CDC, uh, off the CDC website. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but I know you can go- The into CDC their website says, says that masking outdoors is not necessary. Well, they can say that. I mean, that has nothing to do with the teacher's contract or anyone else's contract, anywhere there is to have a contract. I mean, the CDC can say whatever it believes for the people nope. to study. but it doesn't change what our working conditions. What, what I suggest is you come by the district office and okay. talk to Superintendent Aldridge about it. Yeah. yeah. I called Superintendent Aldridge. I, I've spoken with you a couple of, uh, a few times. I've left messages many times. Um, and so I am here at the school board meeting, but I'm happy to do that as well um, because I do think that it is a policy that is outdated um, and doesn't actually make any sense for the policy for children to be masked outdoors at this rate, at this time. Um, also, my next question, so, so as far as things that get on to next meetings, what needs to happen to make sure that this is something that is continued to be discussed? Because if policies can change in a matter of moments, then policies can change. So if you were able to change a policy right before school started, I think that we could make it so that we could change a policy before, quickly before the next school board meeting or at the next school board meeting. So how do we get this that is going to be on the agenda? So that usually comes by request of our board members. So if our board would like to, to have that on the meeting, then that, uh, that is at their purview. Um, it's also uh, as, as a matter of the agenda that it will be on our next agenda as the MOU that I discussed previously will be there. So it will be a, a topic to be commented upon at that time as well. Okay, fantastic. And then Mr. Aldridge also, um, when I first spoke with you, you said that there was gonna be a committee about school nutrition. Um, I never received an email about that. Is that something that is still happening? Did it happen? Did I just miss it? What's going on with the school nutrition since nutrition is so related to the health and well being of our children? And since it seems that the school board is very in, uh, um, concerned about that, I'm wondering if that is something that is still going to be uh, um, in progress. Yes, that is something that we're still working on. We haven't had our first meeting at all. I, um, I still have your name and we'll definitely reach out to you as we, we form that committee. So I'm anticipating in January is when we're going to start that work. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Aldridge, is the, yeah. uh, is the um, contract with WTA specific to COVID um, on the website? 
Um, I do not believe that it is. It would end up being part of the. I, um, I think it would okay. might. Miss Johnson might get some value out of being able to have access to that contract. Okay. We'll, we'll add that in on the website as well. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. How can we do? We want to move and didn't we already move? We got a chart? motion. We don't have a second. There is a motion on the table. There is. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Do we I have second. a second? Oh, good. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Alex. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.